I. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Okay. So, running a little late. I was uh, coming down here expecting to find a sweatshirt sitting here. But I got here and there were none. It's the weirdest thing though, because like, I get these like sweaty sweatshirts from like working out and I just pile them here on this couch. And then every now and then they just disappear. And then I find them folded in my closet. And I'm still trying to figure it out, but regardless of the fact, at least I know where to find them when they disappear. The Lord works in mysterious ways. All right. Revelation chapter four, verse one. After these things, it's a funny phrase. I looked and behold a, sta a door standing open in heaven and the vo first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking immediately or speaking uh, with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this immediately. I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So, um, <laughs> uh, Sarah, you're right. And so, you can give her that raise if you want to. Um, uh, so, after these things, and then he says, after this. So let's back up a page, however many pages you got to back up. Obviously, if you have the right Bible, it's on page 1081. Uh, no, but uh, it says, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which take place after this. So John writes. He writes about Patmos a little bit. And he writes about Jesus who appeared to him, the things that he has seen. He tells them to write the things which are seven letters to seven churches that were in existence at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation in around 95 AD. And then Jesus told him to write the things that would take place after this. Now, he says that same phrase here, after this. Now, in uh, chapters one to three, the word church, the ecclesia, shows up 18 times. You're not going to find it again until the end of the, uh, of the um, tribulation period. All the way through chapter 19, you're not going to find it. That word is absent. Now, if the church were to be experiencing the things from chapter 4 to 19, you'd think there'd be special instruction. You'd think there'd be things said. Uh, but And yet, though, the message to the one church, the faithful church of Philadelphia, they were told that if they persevere, that they'll be kept from the hour of trial. And so it's not a promise of perseverance through the tribulation. It's a promise to be kept from the time period known as the Great Tribulation. Uh, so again, some, some review, because one thing that people, I think, forget quite honestly is that Revelation is a, um, a great book, and good morning, Steve, um, about the Tribulation period. It's a chronology, um, and honestly, the book reads pretty much straight through. Starts with John at 95 AD, Seven letters to seven churches. And get this. This is why, <clears throat> though I don't like the allegorical approach to interpreting the Bible, I don't like the idea that everything's just symbolic about their stuff. I would never deny that types, symbols, and, and, and allegory is used occasionally. And I think that the seven letters to seven churches are seven literal letters. But I also think that God in his sovereign, amazing plan, knew that those seven letters would so 
completely line up with church history that after Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the church that represents the day and age in which we live, saying after this doesn't just mean after this church gets addressed in 95 AD. I think it's also saying after this time period. This is the last time period, the last church, and it's after this that these seven years are going to start. And remember, Jesus, he was saying, I'm coming quickly to the church of Philadelphia. Notice in verse 20 of chapter 3, now he's at the door. I mean, that's the idea. Like, I'm going to come, I'm coming quickly, I'm at the door. And we're going to get to verses 1 and 2 as we're going. But I mean, this is 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Now we're really, this is getting the ball rolling. This is why people like Revelation. If Revelation was just the letters of the churches, it would be basically just a very instructive epistle, right? I mean, the instruction is was so rich these last seven days as we did these seven letters. But it's not the, the prophecy that we would want to look to. And so the idea is, is that now we have the seven years. So, so Daniel chapter 9, you should be familiar uh, with the 70 weeks. And, and it tells us uh, in verse 27 that, 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 that it's 69 weeks, one week shy. And a week was a seven. Um, it's literally seven. And, and to the Jews, you know, uh, the other seven, I went to the market and and it can mean a week or a seven-year period. It's, it's an ambiguous term that context derives the meaning. And so it's seven years. And so at the 69th week, <clears throat> when Jesus was crucified, it kind of put an end to that clock. And the clock's just sitting there waiting to tick that last seven to bring an end to everything. After that seven, everything will come down to an end. Or at least it'll put an end to the age. And we'll have uh, chapter 20 in the millennial kingdom. And we'll talk about that when we get there. So it's kicking off these seven years after these things. And so what happens in these two verses, it, it says he hears a voice like a trumpet come up here. And immediately John is whisked away into heaven. So if we flip our Bibles backwards to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we can read a parallel passage that sounds awfully familiar. It says in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice, here's the voice, of an archangel with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the idea is that we have Jesus' voice, this trumpet sound, the trumpet of, uh, of God. You hear trumpet, you see voice. And Jesus, it doesn't say he descends to the earth. And that's important because in chapter 19 of Revelation, Jesus will descend to the earth. He will touch down on the Mount of Olives and the mountain will split when he hits it. Um, that's different. And this is he descends the clouds. It's like he kind of comes down part way to meet and to greet. And he says, come up here. And he calls us up. And so there's this picture of this in Revelation. Now remember, Revelation is a vision John's having. John's not experiencing the rapture. And so we're not looking for the details to be exact because it, it isn't, John's not prophesying the rapture, but we're seeing a picture of the rapture in the timeline because at the end of Laodicea, now is this event, trumpet, come up here, immediately I'm whisked away into heaven. And that's what happens here. That word in chapter four, verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians, as I look at the people watching, most of you guys know this stuff, right? But I mean, let's make sure we review and whoever watches this later, it's, it's harpazo. And in the Latin, the Vulgate, it's the word rapturos. And the idea is, is it's where we get the rapier, the sword, from. It, the harpazo is where we get harpoon from. This word 
it, it doesn't simply just mean to move or, you know, whatnot. It, it is a violent snatching away. That's the idea of the word. It means to snatch. And so it's this quick thing. It's something that takes place exceedingly fast. In 1 Thessalonians 15, uh, first that's a first Corinthians 15, um, good old Easter chapter right there, letting us know, um, just adding it in here because of Easter tomorrow. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. First Corinthians 15, 14. If the resurrection isn't real, this is all worthless garbage and everything you believe is wrong, which is why the resurrection of Jesus is so important. But if you jump way on ahead to verse 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So there's the transformation that takes place. Our heavenly bodies are given to us at that time. Now, I'd love if someone who's better at Greek studies than me can do a little deeper on this, but verse 52, that last trumpet. So that word for last there, it does not necessitate the meaning of last in a series or final. You see, some say, well, this can't be the rapture or this or rapture's got to be at the end of the tribulation because there's going to be trumpet judgments. You see, last can mean more than one thing. And I you know it's like me, I always say all means all, but it is. It's a title. So the last can mean the last ever. Last trumpet ever. Well, that means there's never going to be any trumpets in heaven. So I don't know. I mean, I kind of imagine there'd be trumpets in heaven. Um, it can mean last in a series for certain. But the last trumpet could also be a title. Just like that's the war trumpet. And that's the distress trumpet. Right? Remember uh, Lord of the Rings? where they go up and they, I think it was at the Helm's Deep. You know, someone have to remind me, right? And they blow that horn. And that was a signal. That was a, a the we need help horn. You only blow the horn when we need help. The last trumpet can also be a trumpet that signals the last, the end. Like when this trumpet blows, because the rapture really is the event that kicks off the end times. We are in the birth pangs. That trumpet blows, it's kicking off. That's the sounding of the end is now coming and all the things that are going to unfold are now happening. And the event of Jesus is coming for his church in which he will come like lightning. See, that's the funny thing. When Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives, they watched him ascend. And it's said that he'll come in like manner and he'll descend and all the world will see him. They'll look on him whom they pierce, all that, right? They'll see him and he'll come down and he'll land on the Mount of Olives. It'll split, etc. But when Jesus talks about the rapture, he comes like lightning. As lightning flashes from the east to the west, so too is this coming of the Son of Man. That's the idea. Different events, they're described in great contrast. And so it says, come up here in verse 2, or verse 1, and in verse 2, and immediately... He was caught up and he was in heaven before the throne of God. John 14. Here's something really cool is that John 14, sometimes we, we almost put this big gap because John 14, 15, 16 is just such an amazing text. But it's a reminder that Right after the disciples were, well, you know, who's going to betray you? And is it me, Jesus? No, it's not you. And then, and then Peter, no, if, if all else depart, you know, if all else leave you, I'll never leave you. No, you're going to leave me too, Peter. You're going to deny me three times. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that when you return, strengthen your brothers. And then immediately, is the flow is, let not your hearts be troubled, chapter 14. You believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house 
are many mansions. And those are many abodes, many dwelling places. There's many places to live. It's not a big fancy mansion, but the idea of a mansion, right? What makes a mansion a mansion? It's the many rooms. It's the fact that the, this big building has all these rooms in it for people to live in, you know, smoking room, billiard room, the garden, you know, with the pipe, Colonel Mustard, a uh, big mansion. So no, it's, it's abodes, places to live. So in my father's house, there's many abodes, places to live. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So we have to put all this scripture together. Revelation 4, 1 and 2. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, 3. And John 14, verses 1, 2, 3. This stuff coming together, now we start understanding a little bit more about the rapture. You see, Revelation doesn't teach about the rapture. It, Revelation teaches the chronology of the end times, but we see it in there. We see it placed at a specific point with specific details to let us know what we're talking about. Now, I'll close on this fun thought because uh, I can't wait to get to heaven. It's not just a true statement, but it's also a great Keith Green song. And I've always liked uh, the little live introduction to one of his recordings where Keith makes the point. He's like, man, I've been thinking about it. You know, if God took uh, six days, you know, to create all of this. And he's been working on my place for 2,000 years. And if that's the case, well, we're all living in a garbage dump. <laughs> and so that's a fun fact is that he's preparing a place for you. He's preparing a place for me. That is where he is right now. And one day at the right time when no one's expecting it, when we least expect it, he's going to call us home. It's going to happen quickly in the twinkling of an eye. Takus. It's a fast thing that you have no opportunity to change the way you are living. And so, like we said a couple Sundays ago, and it was, it was a profound thought for me. Um, if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, what would you do? And if you, or maybe three days, if he's coming in three days, how would you live for those three days? And if that wasn't already your plan, then you're not living right. We ought to have a schedule that we would not change. That's what I maybe actually mentioned if you were with me a few weeks ago and you didn't come to church. I was talking about that epiphany I kind of had where it's when John Wesley was said, if Jesus was coming in three days, what would you do? He said, I'd keep my schedule. G. Campbell Morgan, if Jesus was coming tonight, where would he find you? You see, on the floor with my kids. We ought to be living lives where we can say with boldness, if Jesus was coming tomorrow, I don't need to change a thing. So, live that way. God bless you guys. Have a great Saturday. Have a great Resurrection Sunday.